Ministerial Pride by Richard Baxter Oh, that ever it should be said of godly ministers, that they are so set upon popular air, and on sitting highest in men's estimation, that they envy the talents and names of their brethren who are preferred before them, as if all were taken from their praise that is given to another, and as if God had given them his gifts to be the mere ornaments and trappings of their persons, that they may walk as men of reputation in the world, and as if all his gifts to others were to be trodden down and vilified, if they seemed to stand in the way of their honor. What? A saint? A preacher of Christ? And yet envy that which has the image of Christ, and malign his gifts for which he should have the glory, and all because they seem to hinder our glory? Is not every true Christian a member of the body of Christ? and, therefore, partaker of the blessings of the whole, and of each particular member thereof? And does not every man owe thanks to God for his brethren's gifts, not only as having himself a part in them, as the foot has the benefit of the guidance of the eye, but also because his own ends may be attained by his brethren's gifts, as well as by his own? For if the glory of God and the church's felicity be not his end, he is not a Christian. Will any workman malign another because he helps him to do his master's work? Yet, alas, how common is this heinous crime of envy and pride among the ministers of Christ! They can secretly blot the reputation of those that stand in the way of their own, and what they cannot for shame do in plain and open terms, lest they be proved liars and slanderers, they will do in generals and by malicious intimations, raising suspicions where they cannot fasten accusations. And some go so far that they are unwilling that anyone who is abler than themselves should come into their pulpits, lest they should be more applauded than themselves. A fearful thing it is that any man who has the least of the fear of God should so envy God's gifts, and had rather that his carnal hearers should remain unconverted and the drowsy unawakened, than it should be done by another who may be preferred before him. Yes, so far does this cursed vice prevail, that in large congregations which have need of the help of many preachers, we can scarcely, in many places, get two of equality to live together in love and quietness, and unanimously to carry on the work of God. But unless one of them be quite below the other in abilities, and content to be so esteemed, or unless he is willing to be ruled by him, they are contending for precedency, and envying each other's interest, and walking with coldness and jealousy towards one another, to the shame of their profession, and the great wrong of their people. Hence also it is that men do so magnify their own options, and are as censorious of any who differ from them in lesser things as if it were all one to differ from them and from God. They expect that all should conform to their judgment, as if they were the rulers of the church's faith. And while we cry down papal infallibility, too many of us would be popes ourselves, and have all stand to our determination, as if we were infallible. It is true, we have more modesty than expressly to say so. We pretend that it is only the evidence of truth in our reasons, that we expect men should yield to, and our zeal is the truth, and not for ourselves. We pretend that it is only the evidence of truth in our reasons, that we expect men should yield to, and our zeal is the truth, and not for ourselves. But as that must needs be taken for truth which is ours, so our reasons must needs be taken for valid, and if they be but freely examined, and be found fallacious, as we are exceedingly backward to see it ourselves, because the opinions are ours, so we are angry that our errors should be disclosed to others. We so espouse the cause of our errors, as if all that was spoken against them was spoken against our persons, and we were heinously injured to have our arguments thoroughly confuted, by which we injured the truth and the souls of men. So high indeed are our spirits, that when it becomes the duty of any one to reprove us, we are commonly impatient, both of the matter and the manner. We love the man who will say as we say, 
and be of our opinion, and promote our reputation, though in other respects he is less worthy of our esteem. But we think that one is ungrateful to us, if he differs from us, and deals plainly with us as to our errors, and tells us of our faults, especially in the management of our public arguings, where the eye of the world is upon us. We can scarcely endure any reproof or plain dealing. I know that railing language is to be abhorred, and that we should be as tender of each other's reputation as our fidelity to the truth will permit. But our pride makes too many of us think all men condemn us, who do not admire us, yes, and admire all we say, and submit their judgments to our most obvious mistakes. We are so tender that a man can scarcely touch us, but we are hurt. We are so high-minded that a man who is not versed in complimenting and skilled in flattery can scarcely tell how to speak to us without us being offended at some word which our proud hearts will fasten on and take as injurious to our honor. Oh, therefore, be jealous of yourselves, and amidst all your studies be sure to study humility. He who exalts himself shall be humbled, and he who humbles himself shall be exalted. I commonly observe that almost all men, whether good or bad, do loathe the proud and love the humble. So far indeed does pride contradict itself that, conscious of its own deformity, it often borrows the homely dress of humility. We have the more cause to be jealous of it, because it is a sin most deeply rooted in our nature, and is the most stubborn sin to be extirpated from the soul.